Good evening, everyone. I want to uh, extend a warm welcome to all of you to today's CXO Roundtable on the theme of uh, To Err is Human, Do Quotes Think So? The, fr the phrase, to err is human, means that human beings make mistakes and emphasizes the quality of forgiveness and kindness. The phrase is often completed as, to err is human and to forgive is divine, which makes it natural for human beings to make mistakes as they are not perfect. However, forgiving them is a divine quality, but we are here with a question with do quotes think so? We're all thrilled to have such a distinguished audience of healthcare CXOs, legal experts, industry leaders gathered here today to discuss this vital topic. The objective of today's roundtable is to delve into the complexities and challenges surrounding the medical legal aspects of healthcare. Once again, I, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us today, and I'm confident that this session will be enlightening and beneficial to all. Going on to introducing the moderator, Dr. Nalanda Jaidev. He's a Chief Operating Officer in Rajgiri Hospital, Alua. He has received formal training in medicine, uh, MD Forensic Medicine, Law, and Healthcare Management. Over the past 18 years, he has served across the healthcare spectrum as a clinician, forensic surgeon, secretary of Institutional Ethics Committee, medical legal consultant, and is currently the uh, CEO at Rajgiri Hospital, Alua. He is also the guest faculty for medical jurisprudence at Nuals, Kochi. His primary focus uh, is to facilitate high quality, affordable healthcare within the confines of prevalent medical, ethical, and statutory norms. He routinely convenes medical boards with patients, doctors, and stakeholders as a step towards transparent healthcare delivery. Dr. Jaidev 
has also been providing ex expert opinion to doctors, police, lawyers, and judges in matters per pertaining to health care, legal aspects of healthcare. Welcome to the session, doctor. Over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the kind introduction. Good evening, all. It is indeed a privilege to introduce Sri Mahendra Kumar Bajpai, Advocate Supreme Court of India. He is a, one among the few experts in the country who have the experience and expertise to handle medical legal cases at any forum, including the Apex Court. His knowledge in medical science and the unique ability to switch between the legal and medical jargon places him in a different league altogether. As the Honorary Director of Institute of Medicine and Law and also the editor of the annual Medical Legal Yearbook, he is leading the way in bridging the gap in legal knowledge among healthcare providers. Today, we look forward to learn a few important concepts from him, including the various degrees of errors by a medical professional like rashness, negligent act, and recklessness. Also, how to identify a criminal wrong and a civil wrong. Also, it would be interesting to learn from him which, what is the test to determine the negligence or culpability and also the principle the courts adopt for punishment and compensation. I'm sure Sir will be including a lot of case studies in his presentation as usual. And uh, so let us uh, enrich ourselves by interacting with one of India's foremost authorities in medical legal matters. Welcome and over to you, Sir. <laughs> I'll brush it. It's already there, but uh, uh, that is not what the topic says. Yes, sir. So, err is human. Do courts uh, think so? Because I do understand with my interaction with healthcare providers, they think court does not understand us. There are some inherent problems in the system. And I'll come to that also. Uh, but uh, this grievance is always there, whether it is a doctor, whether it is a hospital administrator, they don't understand. They don't understand. It is not that way. And I'll try to uh, uh, prove it with the, the case laws which I have uh, prepared. So anyway, we'll go ahead. Uh, this uh, entire uh, two, four parts. Uh, we'll first talk about law. What is it that the law expects from a doctor and how is it that the Indian courts are uh, interpreting law, uh, implementing law, and I'll uh, cite only Supreme Court judgments today, uh, uh, nothing from the other courts. Second part, uh, consumer courts are a problem. What are the problems? Uh, that also I'll share with you. And this is one problem where there is no solution. Third part, yes, uh, selective interpretation of the judgments and trying to create uh, uh, you know, uh, brownie points in uh, the medical fraternity. That is something that is happening, uh, should not be done. And lastly, what is it that uh, organizations like CAHO, the medical societies, the professional bodies can do in this atmosphere? I'll try to dwell upon them very briefly. But first part happens to be the core of what I was asked to speak. Before we go to the first part, friends, fundamentals and Dr. Jaydev here. Uh, yes, there is an incident which has happened whether it was avoidable, whether it was not avoidable, whether it was anticipated, whether it was not anticipated, whether uh, the complication that you are, the patient is facing was known, unknown. These are different shades. Again, there is another categorization. Errors, mistakes, accidents, negligence. These are different shades. Some of them are punishable, considered as a wrong. Some of them are not considered as a wrong. Healthcare providers face music in the court because of medical negligence. And uh, uh, today we will focus on negligence. Only. Negligence is a small part of malpractice. Again, today in Indian courts, malpractices cases are not going. 
It is basically negligence cases for which the courts are uh, giving compensation. And in some cases, obviously, criminal charges also are affected. Now, as far as negligence is concerned, as a concept, it talks about the mental state of a person. It has nothing to do with physical act, very little to do with physical act. But very, very interesting topic in law. One place where the law punishes a person without that person being morally wrong. A negligent person is never morally wrong. Every man, every day, n number of times we are negligent. Human nature, you can say, if you are a believer in God, God made the world this way. But to keep order in public policy, when this negligence crosses a certain limit, law steps in for the good of the society and punishes the wrongdoer. And theoretically, this is one place where the law really does not want to punish the wrongdoer. Theoretically, how much the courts are giving effect to that theory, it's a questionable, at least in India too. So, it is a mental state and depending upon the degree of carelessness, the punishment will be attracted. First, when you are diligent, nothing wrong. Carelessness, nothing wrong. But when you are negligent, especially you being a healthcare provider, there being a life and limb on the other side, law intervenes. Again, negligence is different from recklessness. Negligence is simple negligence. Your day-to-day -day wrongs that you keep on doing. Diagnosis uh, ought to have been done after uh, doing certain investigations. Uh, investigations were not ordered. You have not filled the discharge card properly. Medical records were not filled. Pre-surgery tests were not. And all these are simple negligence is fair enough. Here you will only, only attract civil liability. Patient can sue you in a consumer court. Patient can sue you in a civil court. If it is a government hospital, a writ petition can be filed. A human Rights Commission are interfering. Uh, today that question is before the higher courts. The regulatory body can step in, take away the right to practice. Civil wrongs, but not criminal. But negligence in this country is punishable. And doctors have been punished right from the time when the Britishers have, had brought the uh, penal courts. And punishment in crime means imprisonment. When? When the degree of negligence is so high, so high, that it becomes recklessness, gross negligence. Only then you attract criminal liability. Civil liability obviously will remain. So these are some basic fundamentals. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Jaydev, I just could not well more. But I think this will be enough for our today's discussion. So now let us talk about law, not courts. Interesting case from Bombay, Bombay Hospital versus Asha Jaiswal decided in November 30, 2021, Supreme Court of India. The patient is uh, diagnosed with ABD, aortic aneurysm, hospitalized under a vascular surgeon. The surgeon, he performs DSA, CAT scan. Surgery with grafting is performed. Post-surgery patient's lower limbs are found cold. Now the surgeon advises a repeat DSA. This repeat DSA is delayed by three hours. Reason? 
DSA machine in that hospital is not working. And mind you, this is one of the best hospitals, super specialty hospitals in Bombay. Surgeon does not wait. He performs an angiography in the alternative. He advises, let us go in for a surgery. Let us do re-exploration. Again, bad luck. This surgery is performed after 12 hours. The reason OT, all, they have four OTs. All the OTs are occupied at that point in time. So there is a delay in doing DSA. There is a delay in uh, take, doing the surgery. Patient, uh, after the surgery, there is no movement in the lower limbs. Fortunately, unfortunately, fate, whatever you call it, the vascular surgeon has to go abroad for a medical conference. He leaves the patient under uh, qualified doctors and he returns back after a month. By that time, gangrene has set in and below knee amputation happens. Patient develops septicemia, uh, uh, septic shock, and he dies after two. The National Consumer Commission holds the doctors and the hospital negligent. These many things can't happen by chance. That is what the uh, 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 National Consumer Commission says. The Supreme Court says no. There is a plausible explanation given to all these unfortunate events. And let us see what the Supreme Court is saying. The non-working of the DSA machine and consequent delay in performing the test cannot be said to be negligence on the part of the doctor or the hospital. The DSA machine is a large, expensive and complicated machine which unfortunately developed certain technical problem at the time when patient had to be tested. Any machine can become non-functional because of innumerable factors beyond the human control as the machines involve various mechanical, electrical, and electronic components. OTs cannot be presumed to be available at all times. Therefore, non-availability of an emergency operation theater during the period when surgeries were being performed on other patients is not a valid ground to hold the hospital negligent in any manner. It is well known a medical professional has to upgrade himself with the latest development in his field, which may require him to attend conferences held both in and outside the country. Mere fact that the doctor had gone abroad cannot lead to an inference of medical negligence. It is only a matter of chance that all the four OTs were occupied when the patient was to undergo surgery. So many Unfortunate incidents. Explanation given. Proper records are there. Court says no. Although the lower courts have held the hospital negligent. No, this is not negligence. Come to another uh, interesting case. Dr. Harish Kumar Khurana versus Joginder Singh. We all know very elementary that uh, consent has to be taken. If there are two surgeries, you have to take uh, consent for both. And in this case, consent for the second surgery was not taken. Let us, uh, interesting case, very interesting. And uh, the patient's husband, he took out a morcha, etc. also. But ultimately, he lost the case before Supreme. Patient with right kidney stone undergoes surgery. High-risk consent is taken of patient as well as her husband, old uh, 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 aged people. Left kidney surgery is performed. Anesthesia is given by the anesthetists. In the OT notes, the surgeon very specifically records poor tolerance to anesthesia. Second surgery is planned after a week. And here only uh, consent of the patient's husband is taken. On this slide, it's wrong. Patient's husband consent is taken. 
सेम सर्जन सेम एनेस्थेटिस्ट सेम हॉस्पिटल सेकेंड सर्जरी इज परफॉर्म द मोमेंट एनेस्थेशिया इज एडमिनिस्टर्ड देर इज अ कार्डियक शॉक दे ट्राई टू रिवाइव हर पुटर ऑन अ वेंटिलेटर इन द इवनिंग विद इन अ वीक द पेशेंट एक्सपायर the national consumer commission holds the anesthetist negligent supreme court reverses the order and says the patient was also kept in the loop the husband was staying with the patient in that room for a week even the earlier consent was filed was signed by the husband also and now this husband is saying that the anesthetist is negligent only because uh, the patient had not signed no we will not uh, accept this let us see what the supreme court is saying on this consent and in fact it is not only on consent very broad propositions every death of a patient cannot on the face of it be considered as death due to medical negligence unless there is material on record to suggest to that effect friends very elementary law the one who alleges has to prove in a court of law in cases of medical negligence it is the patient who has to prove negligence not the doctor a doctor can keep quiet if the patient fails to prove you are not negligent if he succeeds in proving something you can rebut whatever he has proved the court says further in every case where the treatment is not successful or the patient dies during surgery it cannot be automatically assumed that the medical professional was negligent to indicate negligence there should be material available on record or else appropriate medical evidence should be tendered the negligence alleged should be so glaring in which event the principles of res ipsa loquitur would be made applicable and not based on perception the last line the principle that is laid down which we lawyers call as ratio precedent whatever name you call it the mere legal principles and the general standard of assessment was not sufficient in a matter of the present nature friends we all know that second surgery a separate consent has to be taken patient is uh, adult is in all way competent not taken still the court is saying no we are not going to hold that doctor negligent why because the normal legal principles are not uh, applicable here we are dealing in the field of medicine we are dealing with healthcare providers now we come to a third case where the court holds the doctors negligent again the 2019 case nand kishor prasad versus uh, dr mohib hamidi and others our current chief justice was on this bench simple case young boy with fever abdominal pain hemorrhage referred to the hospital patient's platelet counts were low clotting time was high two units of blood was therefore transfused before surgery surgeon performs exploratory laparotomy why to remove round worms from gut after surgery again two units blood is transfused patient continues to bleed post operatively shifted to another hospital dies state consumer commission holds both the hospital and surgeon negligent the national consumer commission holds only the surgeon negligent but in its uh, the operating part it says it is just we bit negligent not uh, means uh, fine we are asking him to pay compensation we are holding him negligent uh, the poor father lost his uh, young son that's fine but uh, the surgeon was we bit negligent when the matter goes to the supreme court the supreme court says no not we bit negligent the decision to perform that surgery was unreasonable surgeon is negligent not we bit negligent so different degrees of negligence also indian courts are accepting adopting let us see what the court says at the time of admission the patient suffered from abdominal pain fever hemorrhage in both eyes there is no evidence 
that his condition was so critical that he had to be operated even with low platelet counts. Medical records were there, expert opinion was there before the court. From that, the court deduces this inferences. The surgery to remove roundworms was not an immediate necessity to save his life despite critically low platelet count. In absence of any evidence that the surgery was the only life-saving option available at that point in time, the action to operate upon the patient cannot be said to be a prudent decision. Court again clarifies, doctors in complicated cases have to take chance even if the rate of survival is low. The professional should not be held liable for his act or omission if negligent is to make life safer and to eliminate the possibility of recurrence of negligence in future. Friends, law punishes a healthcare provider only for one purpose. And that is to ensure and enhance patient safety, nothing beyond it. But I'm quoting the quote, but in the absence of any evidence that the surgery was the only option, even with low blood platelets, the finding of negligence of the operating surgeon cannot be ignored. It is a case of unreasonable decision of the operating surgeon to operate and not a case of pit negligence so as to absolve the surgeon from the allegation of medical negligence. Court holds the surgeon negligent, not we bit negligent. One grievance which uh, many doctors have and uh, to a certain extent it's justified also. Courts at times do act as a super appellate medical authority. One case obviously decided in 2019, not far uh, uh, back. Court has said courts are not super appellate medical authority. If you want any information, if you want to comment on anything related to medicine, courts have to look into the testimony given by a medical expert, a doctor from the patient side or a doctor side or a hospital side and medical records. There is no other place where the courts can look in. Courts will never have their own opinion, cannot have their own opinion on medicine. Very interesting case, patient with type 2 diabetes undergoes chemotherapy. She has cancer. Uh, later on, she is hospitalized with complaints of chills and fever. Uh, WBC count is higher, antibiotics are prescribed during treatment, nasal tube got uh, dislodged, it was reinserted, cannula stopped functioning, so antibiotics were given orally. After 3-4 days, the patient was discharged with advice to continue antibiotics. Five days later, uh, again her vitals uh, were unstable, she was rushed to a hospital, put on ventilator, shifted to another hospital, but expired after a week. Patient husband sued the hospital. State Consumer Commission holds the hospital negligent. National Consumer Commission holds there was no negligence. And the Supreme Court affirms, yes, there was no negligence. And while affirming the uh, judgment of the National Consumer Commission, very important proposition of law is laid down by this Honorable Supreme Court for the lower courts to follow. Let us read it. Taking into consideration that patient displayed normal vitals, antibiotic was advised to be taken orally. This according to the National Consumer Commission was the professional and medical assessment made by the doctor on basis of patient's medical condition and could not constitute medical negligence. Such a course of action as a super appellate medical authority could not have been performed by the state commission. You cannot interfere in medicine. You are a court. You, you have to look into the expert opinion. You have to look into medical literature. From there, you have to find out what is the reasonable practice, what is the accepted medical practice, what is the standard of care which is considered good. You cannot have your own decisions. That is what the Supreme Court lays down. So friends, to err is human.
yes indian courts are aware of this proposition and they do apply this proposition in cases of medical ne negligence in fact they have to apply another interesting uh, aspects courts can also err they can also be a, give erroneous decision but yes there is an inbuilt mechanism to rectify errors very short slide but i'll share with you something interesting in 2005 in jacob matthew case one of uh, the landmark cases justice lahuti laid down that in all cases of medical negligence if a police complaint is filed the policeman has to bring an expert opinion before proceeding against the doctor but in private complaints so criminal complaints can be filed in two places either in a criminal court or before the police station but in private complaint it is not mandatory that the patient should bring an expert opinion a court has that discretion Uh, as you can see this judgment was passed by uh, a bench uh, comprising of three uh, honorable judges of the supreme court in 2009 justice markande kardju gave a judgment in martin f disuza versus mohammed ishfaq and he says that no expert opinion is compulsory in all cases of civil and criminal medical negligence there is an earlier judgment given by a bigger uh, bench he just uh, gives a judgment and say no that is not the correct law this is the correct law within a year within a year that is corrected another bench it says no martin de souza is not good law that court has heard it is jacob matthews case which will be the good law for this country in private complaint uh, patients of uh, patients need not bring expert opinion so courts do have a mechanism there are times where this mechanism fails so now we come to the first problem where i don't find a solution if this august gathering has some solution please let me know 99% of cases of medical negligence are filed before consumer courts we all know that something that uh, many of you may be knowing any indian citizen can become a member of the consumer courts you call it consumer forum you call it uh, state consumer commission national consumer commission you need not have any knowledge of law you need not be a law graduate you not need not be a advocate you can become a member they call it member but uh, they are de facto judge and these consumer courts they work as a full fledged court national consumer it's good but in the district uh, courts i had the opportunity to appear a few times and it's a pure darbar it's not a grievance redressal authority and ultimately that judgment given by the lower court uh, if the parties have the time money and energy it reaches the supreme court which decides what is right what is wrong so here is the problem if you talk about law law considers that aspect that yes errors are there errors will happen errors are not avoid uh, completely avoidable mistakes will happen there will be accidents which cannot be explained whether the healthcare provider has acted in a bona fide manner has adhered to the accepted medical practice or not we can expect it from the higher courts but unfortunately expecting that from consumer courts uh, i am i have already shared with you i don't have an answer and uh, today uh, some some important changes most of you would be aware nearly all cases of medical negligence will now be filed before district consumer court because earlier the pecuniary jurisdiction was that when the patient files the case uh, the amount uh, that he has given to the doctor plus the compensation that he wants from the 
uh, hospital or the doctor they were clubbed together for the pecuniary jurisdiction now it is only what he has given as fees so up till 50 lakh he, i think 50 lakh happens to be the district court's fee up till 50 lakh if he has given the fee he will fight it out in the district court and then the appellate authority is district state and national that you have to fight it out one more aspect which uh, i would want to draw attention of kaho members dr agarwal specifically earlier the patient had to file a case where either the doctor resides or where the patient was given treatment now the patient can go back home and file the case where he resides think of big corporate hospitals or even charitable hospitals like tatas patients coming all across the country going back to their own districts and filing uh, the case uh, this needs a relook this really needs contemplation what are the way outs legal or policy changes or challenging this? something should be done my second problem yes that has a solution also and that is that amongst the healthcare community, there are some commentators who just try to quote a small portion of the judgment, small portion of what the courts have said, and uh, they create all sort of uh, impressions. I'll share with you one case. Uh, here, the moment this judgment came out, uh, it was oh look all hospitals where any type of surgery is going to happen they must have ICUs. Ultimately, our institute had to come out with an advisory. That nothing of this sort is going to. Nothing of this sort has been said by the court. Very simple case: patient with multiple fibroids, high BP anemia, and underwent hysterectomy. Uh, in a nursing home where there were no ICU facilities, admittedly there were no ICU facilities. Uh, she suffered some post-operative complications. She was shifted to another nursing home from there to another hospital. And she expires after 17 days. <laughs> State Commission holds the gynecologist negligent and the National Commission overrules this judgment. Supreme Court holds the gynecologist negligent. But it observes that the State Commission and the National Consumer Commission both have missed one very important aspect. And that important aspect was that the nursing home where this hysterectomy was uh, advised was ill-equipped. It did not have ICU facilities. Now, the Supreme Court's judgment was only relating to this particular case. There is a difference between per curium, per incurium. But there were journeys who just went on. And at one place where I was also the speaker, I found one gentleman saying, look, this is what is happening. Operation should not have been performed at a nursing home which did not have the ICU. This is what the Supreme Court is saying. Should we shut down all our uh, OTs, uh, our nursing homes? That paragraph 15, you leave aside all other paragraphs of the judgment. Read paragraph 15 completely at least. This is what the Supreme Court has said. We, however, find that neither the State Commission nor the National Commission have examined the plea of the appellant that the operation should not have been performed at a nursing home which did not have the ICU. And it does not stop there. It says when it could be reasonably foreseen, the patient had some complications. Investigations were done earlier. They were pointing out that this patient may face some uh, issues. That without ICU, there was post-operative risk to the life of the patient. So this is a very lethal combination. These journeys who just keep on spreading these lies and the social media. Blissfully unaware of law of precedence, doctrine of stare decisis. But thankfully, there are good people who do come out. And obviously, they come out with the truth. Third problem. Friends, uh, Dr. Agarwal shared with me that uh, the Kahokam conference uh, would be in Kolkata. 
I like that city and I have some very good friends. One of my friends, I won't uh, name him. He was involved uh, in the core group that was uh, trying to defend AMRI hospital and uh, the doctors who were involved. He was not personally involved, but he has a good knowledge of law. And every time I meet him, it's, it's, it's really a good evening. I really enjoy being with him. But the problem starts with that uh, he starts blaming the court and others. Always laments, uh, you know, the patient's husband, that idiot, he was interfering with our treatment. We could not give the proper treatment. But who stopped you from recording that? Even today, how many doctors record? How many hospitals record? Patients' uh, insistence, patients' requests, patients' interference, their attendance interference. We have to learn from mistakes. Doing mistakes at times is condonable. But not learning from mistakes uncondoned. No, it can't be condoned. We know that uh, I will not discuss the case uh, exceeding my time also. Patient was suffering from tan, toxic epidermal necrolysis. She was treated in Kolkata for a few, uh, a few weeks. Later on shifted to Bombay. She died in Bombay. The core issue in that case was whether the steroids which were given, you analyze the case, you will come to this. Whether the steroids which were given were excessive or not excessive. And number two, whether supportive treatment was given uh, in the Kolkata hospital or it was not given. In fact, the Supreme Court is saying that there is a cleavage of opinion between the pro-steroid group and the anti-steroid groups. Clear cleavage of opinion. There are some doctors who say no, steroid was given, that was correct. For such a patient, in fact, there was some confusion even regarding TAN. Dr. Farooq Udwadiya says that it was probably SGS, I am not sure. But there was a cleavage of opinion. And both the sides brought medical literature and experts to prove their point. The court says it was cleavage of opinion, this is not negligence. But there was near unanimity that the dose of steroid that was prescribed, that was administered in Kolkata was excessive. In fact, uh, the first uh, uh, consulting physician, he started a steroid after 10 was diagnosed, another steroid was added. There was no one who was saying, you know, this is not excessive. Questions were avoided, that's fine. But there was no one who said, no, this dose of steroid I would give to my patient. Supporting treatment was missing. The best learning is that the company which made that drug, it was imported from somewhere outside, that steroid. That company says in court, we have given instructions, printed instructions with the drug and those were not followed. Friends, so many learnings from this case. This decision came in 2009, I presume. 15 years have passed. How many doctors read the package insert? What is the company that is manufacturing that drug saying about this drug? How many? You know, I know. 
there are learnings. Have we learned from them? And the answer that comes is no. Friend, it's rather unfortunate that we in India, where are those protocols which the professional bodies must be uh, formulating? Guidelines. NMC will do its job. The government will do its job. What about us? From every case that comes before the court or which comes before you, you can have your uh, share of learning. Are we doing what is required? And friends, uh, I met Dr. Uh, Agarwal, I think a few weeks back, he shared with me a uh, booklet Something uh, that uh, really strike to me, something like convert. So even from court cases, you can come to certain conclusions. Whether it has gone to court, not gone to court. Very commendable initiative. Please keep doing it. Please share it. It will make a difference. Thank you, friends. Uh, thank you for... Uh, Negligent. If he goes on a leave to attend a conference, nor will he be negligent uh, for a failure to provide a sophisticated instrument or an operation theater on time. So that is one message we learned today. Second point is a wrong decision or an unreasonable decision need not always be negligent. But if there is a body of opinion which is near unanimous, then failure to adhere to that opinion would be deemed as negligence. The third message was consent of the patient would be enough if a prior surgery was done by the same team of... Mm. Is that... Did I get you wrong, sir? Uh, don't take it that way. Don't take it that way. Uh, yes, sir, please. So you have to take second consent. Second consent is mandatory. That's what it's mandatory here. The court said it was not mandatory, but if the patient is competent, take a second consent. No, that okay. is not good law here. The court has given reasons. The okay. patient's husband was there with her. Mm -hmm. Okay. Same surgeon did earlier. They had discussed it with the patient. It was not that the patient was in dark, but uh, this should not be a precedent. This is not a precedent. Please, that should not be your take-home message. Oh, thank you, you have to take second consent for second surgery. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that, sir. Because uh, the judgment was, in fact, uh, in favor of the doctor. But the practice was wrong. So, no, so uh, Dr. Jaydev, that is what is there. Yeah. Per curium, per incurium. Okay, when can a judgment be called as a precedent? There are certain rules of uh, interpretation of judgments also. Those have to be applied. Fine, sir. I was just trying to point out, see, the apex court, how it moves, how accommodative it is as far as doctors are concerned. Unfortunately, in the lower courts, this is not getting transferred. Yeah. Another important uh, case law, uh, the Supreme Court uh, ruled that the court should not venture into medical decision making. They should uh, respect the doctor's uh, autonomy in that. Yeah. Thank you for that, sir. And also, you uh, started off with the introduction. You dissected the difference between negligence and recklessness. Thank you for that. So, we would love to have a different session for that altogether. Then, uh, also, sir, uh, one clarification from my end is, sir, you mentioned it is always better to record the undue infer interference by the patient bystander. This record uh, means, uh, is it a documentation or you mean a video recording or something oh. like that? Your documentation in your medical records. Okay, in our records, yes, yes. Yeah. See, this is what the uh, doctors and hospitals are not doing. See, simple thing, you advise an investigation and the patient says, I don't have money. I can't do this investigation. You have advised. I hardly find doctors writing it in their prescriptions or hospitals recording it. You are bound to write it. See, please understand the importance of medical records. If it reaches someone else's hand, that continuity of care, he should know why this investigation was not done. Correct. You leave aside the court aspect. 
let us go purely by therapeutic aspect. Okay. Uh, but they, they come up, we give this medicine. In fact, that judgment, I'll share it with Dr. Uh, Agarwal also. That first judgment of uh, this thing, uh, uh, that 12 crore judgment, where the Supreme Court held that uh, the Kolkata hospital was negligent. There a very beautiful <laughs> comparison is done between the Kolkata hospital and the Bombay hospital. Very beautiful comparison. The interference done in Bombay hospital is recorded by Dr. Farooq Udwadiya. And you will be surprised, uh, Dr. Jaydev, after joining the Bombay hospital in this proceeding, there was no underhand dealing. They filed an application and said that Bombay hospital and Farooq Udwadiya, we want them out of this uh, uh, litigation. Because more documents would have come to point out to this gentleman's interference. Okay, sir. Okay. So the uh, forum is now open for uh, discussion. Uh, can we have? Uh, sir? Can I can I uh, give one more clarification? As far as your uh, uh, statement regarding equipments was concerned, okay. If you are running a tertiary hospital, a super specialty hospital, there are some equipments that uh, you must have. Advanced equipments. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is a difference between I not having an advanced equipment and I have an equipment. Unfortunately, that day it was not working. Okay, okay. There's a difference between both. Okay, because a very recent judgment I saw a, 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 a super speciality of hospital, they did not have uh, some machine known as a capnograph, uh, which you have during the surgeries. And the court has rightly said, uh, you are a super speciality hospital, you charge a bomb. Capnograph happens to be one of the most elementary missions. You don't have it and you perform surgeries. So it should not be taken that way. But yes, there will be times when uh, you don't uh, have those uh, machines. Those machines are not working under repair or something like that. And the patient just comes inside. You want it. You can give an explanation. Yes, the documentation that you have done with the repairing agency and all should be properly kept because uh, someday it may be required in court. Although it's not mandatory to keep all those records. So once again, the intention part becomes uh, critical here. The yeah, intention you have to to provide it is not there. So yeah, fine. And uh, it may not always be under your control. The... Absolutely. 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 Fine. So uh, can we move on to the questions, please? Sure. That's a huge financial, you know, burden on the institution even to go for an appeal. And I have read several judgments that uh, uh, where, you know, even if we win the case in the appeal and then, you know, uh, the courts have uh, commission, honorable commissions and the courts have said whatever the deposit amount has been already been dispersed to the, you know, um, uh, victim or the uh, claimant, complainant. So you can, you need not collect it back, but we hold you not negligent. So it, it is not a thing that even if you win the case, you will get the deposit back or something. Sometimes it may be given. So what is your take on that, sir? Oh, no, no. So uh, there were cases, but there by consent, uh, the patient was a very poor man and he was in bad shape and he wanted, uh, you know, further treatment. Uh, the hospitals and the doctors by consent have said, okay, let him uh, uh, realize this money. Uh, otherwise, uh, no, if he loses the case, your money comes back. But what you said that makes sense. Yes, 50% depositing, it's not a sound decision. Because mm -hmm. the insurance will give you money after the final decision, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why the pre-deposit thing is one huge uh, change that which I wanted to add to that. And another thing, sir, what uh, I mean, what uh, uh, the moderator, sir, was telling about this, uh, you know, when we interpret, I, I, as you rightly said, uh, we need to be careful about how we interpret the uh, conditional thing, what the court is telling in the judgments. In the sense, going to conference is not a problem. That is true. But the condition here is that uh, do with the proper handing over to the appropriate person and then go, not just going to conference is not wrong, is a, a broad statement. But the condition is that, that we have to hand it over to the appropriate person and then the patient is, you know, with all due precautions, then going is not a problem. I think in that uh, AMRA hospital case also, the treating doctor did not have a handing over notes and all those things. That was also one of the important points raised in the judgment, if I'm not wrong. 
And the third uh, thing is that which I have a personal question to ask. The most of the cases, the you know the uh, commissions, consumer commissions, as well as the courts, honorable courts have uh, interpreted uh, the standard of care in terms of Bolam's test. So far, we, that has been considered as a standard. We are following that in our country. Uh, I think uh, very few cases I have seen where Bolito's principle is also applied and the court has uh, rejected the doctor's opinion in some instances saying that uh, we don't agree with you and all those things. But have we, uh, ever, have we ever had any case where Montgomery principle is applied in terms of concern, sir? Have you come across any case where Montgomery principle is applied? So, uh, Dr. Agarwal, this uh, answer will take five minutes. Please go ahead, sir. I told you that. Okay. So, uh, see, three very important international laws, uh, sir, you have shared with me, Bolam's law. Okay. Uh, again, when you doctors analyze laws, you analyze it in your own little way and God knows all what. Bolam's law was very simple. 1954-56 patient was of uh, you know suffering from depression. He was given electric shocks. Okay, while giving electric shock, the uh, neurologist consciously takes a decision that only one male nurse will put a gag on the mouth of the uh, patient, and number two, I will not give muscle relaxant before giving electric shock. Electric shocks are given. This gentleman, Bolam, he reacts violently, falls down, he breaks some of his bones, he sues that hospital, Friar Hospital. Evidence is brought by both the parties, the patient as well as uh, Friar Hospital. And there is a clear cleavage of opinion. One uh, group says, okay, by, we would have given muscle relaxant. The other says, no, we would not have given muscle relaxant. It was not the case that that hospital did not have nurses. There were three male nurses standing uh, near the head of uh, Mr. Bo uh, Bolam. Okay, only one. And, and, and the neurologist, he gives an explanation to the court. Okay, for this reason, only one nurse will put a gag. That's all. There were others who opposed it. Now, if you, the take home message for uh, healthcare providers here should be one, if there is a cleavage of opinion, if there is a difference of opinion, and you follow any one opinion, you are not negligent in the eyes of you. Even if the course of treatment that you take happens to be the followers of that treatment happen to be in a minority, no problem. Please go ahead. But your medical science must somewhere vouch that this treatment is also one treatment. It can't be I and my neighbor, we decide, yes, this is good treatment and we go ahead. No. Medical science must vouch for that. The second learning is, merely because the patient has suffered some harm, injury, death, a doctor is not negligent. Doctor merely has to follow accepted medical practice. What is found in medical journals, books, Authoritative one, today all sort of crap things are there on the internet. No, your authoritative journals, whatever they say you have followed, you have followed medical science. Number two, medical practice. Science may be saying something, but in Bombay we practice something like this. Good. It is. It should not be too far away from medical science. And that medical practice is there, the court will say. So this is the take home message from Bolam irrespective of what other people are saying, Bolam's law is still the gold standard. Now let us come down to Bolithos. Bolithos is more of an evidence. Okay, 94 judgment. In Bolithos, what happens is, there is one set of doctors who gives an opinion, this is the right way. There is another set of doctors which gives another opinion. And the court rejects the other opinion. <laughs> And the court, why it is rejecting? Now, again, in the earlier judgment, which I had uh, shared with you, uh, 
सुपर अपेलेट मेडिकल अथॉरिटी कोर्ट कांड बी सुपर अपेलेट मेडिकल अथॉरिटी एंड देन बोली थो दी कोर्ट से फाइन दिस इज अ मेडिकल एक्सपर्ट ओपिनियन वी आर रिजेक्टिंग इट बिकॉज इट इज इलॉजिकल बिकॉज इट इज अनसाइंटिफिक एंड फॉर ए बी सी रीजन कोर्ट हैज नो वेर इंटरफियर विद बोलम्स लॉ the it 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 is by all means a procedural aspect today day in day out in indian courts courts are rejecting expert opinion not logical you have not answered the right question you are taking us round and round and round that is bolithos so ultimate arbiter the ultimate authority to decide whether that expert opinion will be accepted or not accepted is going to be the court the court has to give reasons logical reasons scientific reasons and the court's reasoning cannot be beyond medical science so leave that to lawyers now coming back to montgomery in montgomery what was the it it, it is in a very small compass if you really analyze that judge okay the uh, patient underwent some uh, procedure and she said that uh, uh, while taking consent uh, while counseling the doctor did not uh, uh, inform me about abc things and the doctor said i thought this was not right and the court says no it uh, uh, while counseling while giving information it is not what you think is reasonable it is what the patient thinks reasonable so all three judgments are in different uh, arenas the third judgment uh my humble submission again i am a poor lawyer ultimately it is the court which will decide what is good what is bad according to me montgomery will not be applicable in india because in samira kohli's case the honorable supreme court has said look at the socio economic condition in india we are rejecting informed consent canterbury's informed consent that is there in america no here the consent has to be real consent so montgomery to by no means would be applicable here and again i find it very foolish you know those american doctors speaking for hours before the patient uh, trying to uh, counsel them and take their consent and then all that is um uh, think about how the court looks at the doctors and their decision making so i had uh, one question which is regards to um, the thing about uh, when you mentioned that when a patient or the relatives or the relatives specifically in my case when i'm discussing this uh, we have uh, this set of uh, patients where um, they refuse a particular kind of treatment now when it's uh, something of an elective procedure we do understand that in an elective procedure if the consent is not obtained and the patient or the relatives they refuse then it's that the patient autonomy holds true and meaning they have every right uh, now coming to the other extreme of it like for an emergency uh, life saving procedure again it's quite clear that again it's the onus is on us had to take that decision and save the life of the patient for example let's say cardiac arrest happening you won't be sitting there taking a consent for the same or a life threatening thing which requires an urgent surgery where from what i gather the Uh, the physician or the surgeon is actually uh, consider meaning he should be safe if he has done something within the ambit of the medical knowledge to save the life of the patient in an emergency situation so my question is in this now this middle area where we get these patients who are uh, quite sick it may be the elderly or a patient who's quite sick does not fall into that entire criteria of a uh, a patient who's in uh, with a malignancy or uh, those things kind of thing where they go into the dnr kind of thing where uh, now to be safe doctors are now trying to take for everything take a consent about an intubation for a tracheostomy i'll give you a simple scenario so we have a patient uh, for example a patient who's uh, sick and doing a tracheostomy for that patient definitely brings down from my aspect it definitely brings down the mortality rate for the patient because the icu stay will be uh, shorter the patient can be taken off the ventilator faster but the patient is comatose doesn't uh, can't give the consent for it is mainly the relative which is given so in such cases from what from what you said i understand that we need to document that they are refusing this particular procedure 
but this is something kind of a thing which definitely makes an impact on the mortality rate of the patient. So what is your take? How should we approach this particular thing, sir? See, again, that patient autonomy comes in. Okay. So you have to respect what the patient or the patient's relatives are saying. Okay. Although uh, very authoritatively, the Supreme Court has yet not commented on these aspects. Okay. See, this is a real life dilemma. Every intensivist faces it in, in, in the IC. Yeah. Want to do tracheostomy, want to put on ventilator, relative sin. Now, what, what is the pragmatic way of? Okay. Ethically fair, there will be debates because ethics, uh, it uh, changes from man to man. Your ethics and my ethics may be different. But law is uniform for you and me. Okay. So legally, it's a dilemma. Best way out, who is the relative how closely is that relative related to the patient? Some sort of an identification. And you can just take it in writing from that. When you are saying you don't want to put your uncle on ventilator, write it down. You are protected in your medical records. If you take a handwritten road, you are legally protected. And I would say ethically also you have done nothing wrong. If the patient's relatives don't want to put the patients on uh, the ventilator, they don't want to do tracheostomy. What can you do? Your hands are tied. But so who just... document? If they can write down. If they can write down on your medical records, yeah. it's a good protection for you legal. And ethical also. Uh, uh, uh... Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So go ahead. One question when you said when you mentioned about this, we get this small subset of patients' relatives. Uh, even when we are giving this like for the in the critical care and for when you said uh, we asked them to just sign or write down this has been explained to you and we are not consenting for them. Uh, some of them get very jittery. They don't want to put their signature. So does uh, when they refuse to sign, is it fair enough? Does the court take it that when we have written that we have uh, informed them, they have refused to sign and we document the doctor's thing is taken? Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. You will be surprised, doctor. Uh, courts generally don't disbelieve. Indian courts, I can vouch for it. Okay? They don't disbelieve in what you have written. When you have done, you know, gross manipulation and fabrication, it's a different ballgame. Otherwise, if you have written your medical records have been produced, you are safe. Courts will believe in it. All right, sir. Thank you so, so much. Vajpayee Ji, I, I'm just uh, asking a question which is related to what Pratish had asked. Very interesting. Um, a number of times what happens is that the patient is put on the ventilator with the hope that he will revive or something. Three, four days or five days and after that, doctor also is realizing that it is a hopeless situation. The pay, family is also thinking, boss, no, all right, now you take it off. Now that is where the dilemma, big dilemma is there for the intensivists. How to and what steps should I take to take him off the ventilator. And the family is also saying, I can't afford. There is also a financial situation uh, that how can I continue to keep, keep him on that? What do we do? Sir, Kaho must intervene and take this question <laughs> to the ethics. What practically people do is they just get the Dharma yes. form sign from yes. the relatives. <laughs> they ensure that the patient does not uh, expire in their hospital premises. Or fear Bhagwan ke bharose jo bhi ho hai. But it needs clarity because especially in intensive care, this is a dilemma every hour an intensivist faces. Yeah, because it's a huge amount of financial burden also on the family. Who is going to pay for it? Not the government is not paying. So I think the last person, Dr. Ganeshan, you want to have something? You have raised your hand. Just unmute yourself, sir. Unmute. Hello. Um, yes, thank yes. you very much for a very interesting and enlightening session. I have two questions. One relates to the definition of reasonable practice in the eyes of Indian law. Um, in UK, if uh, two practitioners concur, then that is considered a reasonable practice. My no, 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 no. Bolitos. Just now we talked about Bolitos. Even if 10 do, ultimate arbiter will be the court. Yeah, I mean, in term, yeah, I mean, the arbiter would be court. 
but in terms of at least you can argue that it is a, or put forward that it is a reasonable practice um, so in terms of my understanding from uh, your kind of um, uh, answers to the previous questions should i mean if there is a published evidence of um, different opinions then that is easy but in large uh, parts of medical practice there may not be publication but still there may be more than one way of doing things uh, in those kind of things what would be the court's views in terms of um, uh, a patient was treated with a drug x a drug y or a procedure was done another case procedure wasn't done how do courts take view would a group of a, a broader consensus of doctors a team decision would that make a difference see i have already uh, spoken on this earlier i'll again see whatever name you call standard of care accepted medical practice reasonable practice bolam's law okay it's one and the same thing what are the courts really looking at courts are looking into whether you have acted in a way that is endorsed by medical science or not from where are you going to get medical science from your commentaries from your textbook see in cases of medical negligence especially before national consumer commission if you get time please go there you will find advocate of uh, patient and advocate for uh, hospital both having harrison same edition one pointing to paragraph 17 the other pointing to paragraph 19 so the courts are bothered about medical science now your question about medical practice now medical practice can deviate only to a certain level away from medical science as a as a doctor you this is medical science this is nothing to do with the uh, law i'll i'll give you a illustration a real case somewhere in kerala okay uh, hysterectomy was performed and uh, some complication happened now the uh, patient she brings in a us doctor as an expert and the us doctor says look in us before a hysterectomy we perform d and c not performing d and c before hysterectomy is per se negligence now this doctor she goes to the local uh, uh, medical colleges brings the head of department and the head of department says look here in india we don't perform d and c we perform abc test if they are right fine we go ahead with hysterectomy and the court says fine this is practice so there can't be a law in black and white you can't draw the lines see here comes the role of professional bodies i incidentally happened to go through for one matter uh, you have that american i think heart association or physician association they have a guideline on fever 1200 pages now that is to guide the patient that is to guide the uh, doctor also to courts also so for courts also it is important that these guidelines these sops these protocols are there because when the court has to go through those labyrinth of uh, you know uh, uh, articles downloaded from uh, internet it becomes a big problem in finding out what is it that we can call as accepted medical practice so medical science from authoritative books you can blindly follow them you have something if medical practice deviates how much deviation is permissible that would depend on case to case basis and what would constitute a medical practice that again uh, would be a big question mark i and my neighbor are doing it two of us and rest uh, 10000 are not doing it no this can't be medical practice what you are doing is wrong there has to be a responsible minority if at all the minority is doing it okay and see it has to be logical you are working in science so the answer thank can't you. be in black yeah i Short understand time. thank you sir the next question was relating to the do not resuscitate orders and that i guess is a bit of a gray area in indian law is there any 
cases where it has been contested and are any guidelines available from the legal perspective about specifically documenting in the patient notes about DNR, uh, do not resuscitate orders. Thank you. I think you all are hell bent on uh, making me and Dr. Agarwal enemies. This is one more place where Kao should intervene, do something, or someone should do. Already, Supreme Court has come up with a guideline on advanced medical directive, very impractical. Okay. So now you have something written in law, in black and white, that has to be followed. But no one has followed till date. No AMD has been registered. It will not get registered the way it is there. The only way out is some DNR should be uh, given uh, validity. Unfortunately, uh, this lies in the domain of uh, uh, the legislature. They should come out with law. But uh, that we can't expect. So let us have some thing with the judgments that have already been given. There is AMD. You, If you ask me legally, you have to follow what the Supreme Court has said in its judgment of common cause. Advanced medical directive. If it has been done in accordance with the uh, Supreme Court guidelines, then only you have to follow. All these do not resuscitate uh, living wills and all, they have no effect in India. Thank you, sir. sir uh, we have two questions in the chat box. Uh, quickly, if you can take those up. Will the proposed Bharatiya Nyaya Samhita have any impact on the medical legal system? Banjane DJ Kanun, let it become law, sir. Then we will try to analyze it. Why should we should waste our energy now? Okay, sir. Then the last question is, sir, according to the recent NMC guidelines, generic names has to be uh, prescribed by the doctors. So the pharmacy or hospital decides which medicine or brand uh, that can be dispensed. So who will be responsible for the clinical outcome now? This question is from Afinal Joy, Administrator, MAJ Hospitals. It will always be the doctor, poor doctor. I presume that is why uh, medical associations are uh, uh, raising their voice against this uh, particular uh, uh, provision. Okay. I recently saw one letter which was written by IMA HQ. Very nicely, they have written down that uh, the quality of drugs is a big problem in India. So uh, you don't do anything on that aspect and you try to discipline us. Fair. But this is in the domain of, uh, you know, either the doctors or the lawmakers. Let them decide what will remain, what will not remain. Dr. Vijay Agarwal should comment on this. I think he's the right man. I think, sir, uh, enough for the today's dose uh, because I think uh, we will require a continuous kind of an interaction with you. And uh, definitely, I think uh, all of us have got much more clarity about things. Uh, it, it was a very enlightening session. And uh, absolutely, I'm very, very thankful to you and to Dr. Nalanda Jayadev for moderating this session. And is Madam Bharti ready here or Father Johnson? Yeah, we are here. Yes, I Father. think very, someone interested yeah. with formal uh, vote of thanks. Bharati ma'am, can yeah. you take it up? Uh, hello, sir. A uh, very good evening yeah, to one and all. Uh, I'm Dr. Arjun, founder and CEO of Dentocrest and also representing Kaho Dental Division. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank uh, Doc, uh, Advocate uh, Mahindra Kumar Bajpai, sir, for his sharing his thoughts, views, and also on how the courts uh, think and operate before arriving at a decision. So, Mr. Bajpai also shared quite a few interesting cases and gave insights into it. Thank you, sir, for that. Uh, I would also thank uh, Dr. Uh, Alanda Jaidev for uh, moderating the session. Uh, also, finally, I would like to thank all the 40 CXOs from various hospitals who actually attend, attended the session. And I hope you had good takeaways from the session. Uh, so we now come to the end of the session. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.